Welcome to Last Orders, the Spiked podcast on all things Nanny State. I'm Tom Slater, Deputy Editor at Spiked, and this is the show where myself and Chris Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs discuss the latest news in modern day killjoyism, all with the help of an invited guest. Today we're joined by the financial writer, author and comedian Dominic Frisby to discuss fixed odds betting terminals, the plans to slap a syntax on meat and the endless crusade against vaping. Hello and welcome to Last Orders. I'm Tom Slater and today, as ever, I'm joined by Chris Snowden, the IEA's Director of Lifestyle Economics and the author of the book Killjoys, A Critique of Paternalism. Hello, Chris. Hello, Tom. And we're delighted to be joined by Dominic Frisby. Dominic is a financial writer, he's a comedian, and he's the author of Life After the State and Bitcoin, The Future of Money, which probably gives a bit of a sense of where you'll be coming at these questions from. How are you doing, Dominic? I'm very well, thanks, Tom. How are you doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. So to kick things off, we're going to talk about FOBTs, which are so-called fixed odds betting terminals. These are the electronic gambling machines you'll see lining the walls of your local bookies and over the last couple of years have really been presented as a new scourge of Britain labelled the crack cocaine of gambling and there's been a concerted effort I think it's fair to say to clamp down on them and earlier this year parliament indeed voted to lower the maximum stake from £100 to £2. Our FOBTs were in the news more recently because Tracy Crouch the minister who was pushing for that reduction resigned over government's decision to delay the measure in the last budget. So this plan to reduce the stake I think it's fair to say has been pretty uncontroversial in Westminster. It's got the support of everyone from Jeremy Corbyn to Jacob Rees-Mogg. And no doubt because they seem to have bought this line that these machines are incredibly addictive, that they're a scourge on problem gamblers and that they're pushing more of them even to the brink of suicide. So Chris, I know that you're against the lowering of this stake. How could you as any feeling human being be against something like this? Aren't they really addictive? Aren't they something that people should be tackling? Yeah, it's, it really is just me, I think, who is prepared to stand up <laughs> for the fixed odds betting terminal consumer. It's been a very, very clever and well-thought, coordinated campaign against the FOBTs, it has to be said, and in the end it was inevitable, I think, that they would drop the stake. I should explain to people who don't know that dropping the stake is more than just some minor administrative change. These games are overwhelmingly roulette or blackjack, that's what people play on them, mainly roulette, and they're not jackpot machines, so they're not like the machines you might see in your pub or snooker club where you put a quid in to win 250 or 500, you put in two quid and you win two quid, basically, and there's no real excitement in doing that, which is why it's got a higher stake, so if you go into a casino, the minimum you'd be able to bet on these games would be five or ten pounds, um, there's no point playing for one or two pounds, it's just boring, so generally people pay for a few quid, five quid, ten pounds, whatever it may be, um, and then you, you get a bit of satisfaction out of it. They are actually uh, the fairest machines on the market uh, insofar as they pay out at about 97%. Roulette and Blackjack are pretty fair games. The house has a small edge, but it's it's only quite small. Compare that to a normal gambling machine, you're talking about 75-78% uh, return, generally speaking. So how are they being effectively banned? Because the, the bookies will just get rid of these now. It's, there won't be enough people who want to play them. How's it happened? Well, it's a very murky story, really. But essentially, a guy called Derek Webb, who is a casino tycoon, mainly based in Las Vegas, he invented a game called Three Card Poker, uh, made a lot of money from that. It's a very fine game. It's played in casinos all over the world. And back in the early days of FOBTs, he found that the they had that game on it. So he thought about suing the makers, and then he was told, actually, you don't have the rights to sue um, because you don't own the digital rights, you only own the table game rights. And so he decided instead he was just going to create a campaign against FOBTs. And he said this, he said this in a Guardian interview some years ago, it's it's on the record. Sorry to interrupt you, I'm, I'm totally gripped by this. It was like, it's like, it's like a guy who's created, I, I see this quite a few times with a number of different things where guys have been heavily involved in the creation of something and then at some point have been shut out of it and then get so upset by the way that they've been shut out. They almost get psychologically damaged by it and then they then attempt to take it down. So, for example, I once wrote a, a film that did very well, but I wasn't properly credited for it. And the film was then incredibly successful. And I saw the film doing really well, but I wasn't given any credit as the guy who wrote the film. And so I sort of found myself in this situation where I was slagging off the film on like forums and stuff and telling people it was shit. <laughs> the film I wrote because I didn't want it to be successful because I haven't... Do you see what I mean? So, this, and so is, is, that, is this the same dynamic that this guy was going through it's, where he wanted to get revenge? Yeah, kind of. I think it's just a grudge match. I, I, I don't know. 
but is there know, not Derek Webber, what, he, what he's thinking? But he he has a lot of money, and he presumably thought, well, it'd be a bit of fun to run a campaign against these things since I can't beat them in court. But, but it's also fair to say that a lot of people have jumped on this campaign. So of course, Tracy Crouch, who was the minister who yep. was pushing this through, I think it's fair to say has been kind oh, of turned been into a bit of a secular saint for for right. really standing yeah. by this, and also various campaigners, single issue campaign groups even, full of people who um, purport to be um, former fob tea addicts, mm-hmm. etc. I mean, so what do you make of their claims that these machines are um, incredibly addictive, that they're far worse than any of the other forms of gambling, that this is just about this particular product and how... Well, it is it. possible with any form of gambling to wheel out some people with, with sad stories and who have lost everything or got divorced or started stealing off their bosses or whatever it is because of their gambling. Now, if you wanted me to form a campaign to stop dog racing, I'd be able to find you people who've done exactly the same thing with dog racing. You'll tell you that dog racing is the most addictive thing, worst thing uh, going. They, they, they lost everything as a result of it. You can do that with everything. And funnily enough, since the properties have been dealt with, we were already having people... Uh, who are addicted to online gambling being wheeled out because that's the next step is to move on to online gambling. So I started looking into this a few years ago just to see what the evidence was. I was totally open-minded about these machines being in some way worse than your average form of gambling. And there just it hasn't been any evidence. All we've had is a, a pack of lies about problem gambling rates doubling or quadrupling over the years about them being the crack cocaine of gambling, which, and this is my favorite fact about properties, crack cocaine of gambling is a term goes back to the 1980s was not originally used about fixed odds betting terminals. It was used about uh, Kino, which is a video poker game. That, that term was invented by a casino operator in America who was trying to close down his digital competition. So there's a slight parallel there. That key casino owner's name? Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> True story. He's here in everything. So, yeah, there's been no evidence the whole way through. And as a substitute for evidence, we've just had various um, snappy phrases like crack cocaine and gambling, various untrue claims about rates of problem gambling up, and various uh, sad stories from people like Matt Zard Cousin, who've come along and helped the campaign out. And as a result, it's got so much momentum that it it seemed unstoppable. Even a couple of years ago, it's obvious that this was going to happen. But what it has done is it's kicked open the door now to further nanny statism with gambling, and they didn't even miss a beat. But from the moment the government went along with it, it was obvious they were going to move on to online gambling in particular, and also gambling advertising, and without missing a beat, that's exactly what's Mm. happened. I'm pretty libertarian in my politics, so just about any issue you care to mention. Usually, when the government gets involved in some way, even when the intention is to do good, in fact, usually when the intention is to do good, they actually make the situation worse. And you get loads of situations where regulation has unintended consequences that are way worse than if they just left the original thing as it was. War on drugs is perhaps the best example of all. And But the two areas where I doubt myself most are guns and gambling. And it's for the simple reason that my cousin's husband has just wrecked their whole life gambling. You know, he borrowed money against the house without telling my cousin. Then they lost their house and they had two young kids and now he's in jail and da da da. You know, horrible, horrible gambling addiction. And so, you know, when I saw this um, Tracy Crouch story, I just looked at it without following the story. And, my, and I was, I must say, I must have been completely taken in by the narrative. I thought, oh, look, there's a principal politician. Look, she's really standing up for what she believes. She's resigned. I was glad she resigned because it was just another thing to upset Theresa May at a time when we badly need her to be taken <laughs> out. And uh, that's there's another case for gun laws there. And uh, <laughs> that was a joke, um, just in case anyone's going to hold it against me. But so I was completely swallowed up by the whole narrative. I didn't even know what a fixed it odds betting term it is and never played it but as soon as I listened to you talk Chris you know I, I suddenly realised oh god they've done it again they've just smeared the whole thing they've done the manipulative thing they're doing good and they'll present some figures I'm sure that look we've saved this much gambling losses by uh, making this thing illegal but what always happens with those figures is it's they never measure the, the damage that gets done elsewhere what I read in one of your articles, Chris, about what's going to happen with, you know, these guys who want their fix from fixed os betting terminals is just going to drive them into other forms of gambling. And the more that they regulate against gambling, the more the quicker they're going to drive people into online gambling, which is the realm of hackers. The bodies in charge of the websites aren't based 
They're, they're just distributed bits of code that own, aren't owned by anyone. Mm. And they cannot stop that. Well, yeah, people so are the unintended go consequences is, is going to make... Well, the, it's, it, the unintended consequences are so obvious, you can oh, scarcely call them unintended, almost. I mean, well, the people are going to go online. Maybe there is a hope amongst some of the people who have been campaigning against these things that they will go to pubs to play fruit machines or arcade, yeah. uh, amusement arcades to play uh, the, the games. That would certainly explain why some of the pubs and amusement arcades and indeed casinos have been financing the all-party parliamentary group on fixed odds betting terminals to lobby against these things. But mainly they're going to go online, quite obviously. And uh, this was admitted on the day of the announcement, I did quite a few radio interviews because, as I say, I'm the only person in yeah. Britain who stands up for them. Um, and nearly all the people I was up against were going like, well, this is a great step forward. But, of course, a lot of these people are going to go online where the stakes are unlimited. Mm. Um, so we need to look at that next. And I was like, I've been saying this for five years that people are going to go online. I have no real problem with people going online. But you can play the exact same game as faster and for more money in a much less regulated environment. Mm. Online And with no other human beings there, for instance, to say, you know, if someone walks in, they obviously shouldn't be there if they've already asked to be right. self-excluded. And, and they're not, they're not creating jobs on British high streets and they're yeah. not paying tax in the UK. They reckon about 20,000 jobs might go as a result of this. I, I personally think most bookies will close down. I mean, the industry, the betting shop industry as a whole, makes most of its money now. Uh, just over 50% from fixed odds betting terminals. And I haven't seen their books, but it seems to me if you're making most of your money from a machine that's been effectively banned, the chances are you're going to close. But ordinary people are just going to think, well, so what? Betting shops are bad. Yeah, they do. And that's but they're not going to so cure the problem, are they? By They can close down their business, but mm. they're not going to cure the problem. No, and that's why I think actually you're probably wrong when you say that they'll come out in a year or two and say, look, things have got much, much better. They won't do. Um, because the incentive for these guys is to always make things seem as if they're getting worse. Um, so I don't think we'll see any celebration in a year or two. I think we'll continue to hear the problem. Go- uh, oh, no, I meant a rising. celebration of that particular decision. Uh, but the problem, yeah. I, well, I the, bo- yeah well, the bookies have lost a, a huge amount of money. They might, yeah. they might call that a, a reason to celebrate. Um, but no, there will be no winding down of the moral panic about gambling. Quite the reverse. It will continue escalating. But I can tell you that like, Bitcoin is like massively libertarian, as you as you all know, and like gambling is rife mm. in that whole thing. There's just so many like different forms of codes and developments for for gambling. And believe me, you know they should better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Right. <laughs> You're listening to Last Orders. If you're enjoying the show, why not give us a rating and a review? It takes 30 seconds and it really helps us reach new people. Now, back to the show. Okay, next up, let's talk about meat. So this month, scientists at the University of Oxford urged governments to consider imposing price hikes on red meat, such as beef, lamb, pork, to reduce consumption. So there's a lot of big claims being made about this new syntax on meat that apparently it could prevent as many as 6,000 deaths each year in the UK, save the health service hundreds of millions of pounds. And interestingly, they're presenting it very much as an attempt to save the planet as much as kind of save us from ourselves, um, arguing that cutting meat is the primary thing you can do to tackle climate change on your own back um but for the rest of us chris it's fair to say this just seems like one in a long line of syntaxes it started with smoking and drinking we've had sugar more recently and now something just as mundane as as meat so just to sort of before we get into the kind of question of how we got to this point where the idea of a meat tax was mooted do any of these arguments for it really stack up that it's going to be good for our health that it's going to save money for the health service and that's going to save the planet effectively possibly in, in in all fairness i mean i don't know I don't really care about the whole climate change issue, so I haven't looked into the you know, negative externalities supposedly associated with eating red meat. I imagine they're inflated like all other estimates by campaigners. But in theory, at least, there could be a case for a Pagovian tax on red meat if it is a major contributor to greenhouse gases. And if the alternative, whatever that is, chicken, I suppose, would be less harmful. But I don't know. And as I say, I don't, I don't really care. Uh, on the health side of it, no, there isn't. I mean, processed meat has been plausibly linked with a few cancers, colorectal cancer, for example. Red meat, less convincingly so, but it's it's possible. I think actually it comes down to how you cook it more than anything. But even even if there are a certain number of deaths associated with eating processed and red meat, 
And the figure, I think, in the study was actually much more more than 6,000. I think oh, it was really? implausibly high. It was not like 77,000. And in, in America, nearly 600,000, which is like more than a, a fifth of all deaths. <laughs> so it was a, a terrible, terrible study, um, just as a piece of modelling. And I think there is a pretty potent trio of single-issue campaigners who could make this happen. Um, you've got the vegans and vegetarians, you've got your climate change campaigners, and you've got your public health people who are desperate to find something else to treat like tobacco. So I certainly am not writing off the possibility that this will happen, just like all the other taxes you just mentioned happened. Dominic, what do you make of all of this, and particularly this kind of unholy alliance we're seeing form between the, the vegans, the environmentalists, and the public health types? Imposing a new tax is a very risky thing for a leader to do. And what they will always do is try and find a moral argument to justify the imposition of the tax. Because often using that moral argument, they can buy enough favour with enough people. That's why you're seeing this narrative emerge of by eating meat, you're bad for the climate. By taxing you on meat, we're protecting your health. We're saving money for the NHS. That's all part of this using the moral argument. And there's nothing new in that. It's always happened. Even the words we have for tax, things like tax is your duty. There's, you know, there's always this moral argument. And there was one, a good example of that is in the um, medieval times. If you were a knight and you didn't want to go and fight for your king in the Crusades, as many a sensible knight might not wish to do. But if you wanted to do that, you had a tax levied against you called the cowardice tax. <laughs> <laughs> so I think now this narrative is evolving. I think it's inevitable. That doesn't make it good. Mm. Um, Chris, does this basically confirm that the slippery slope is real insofar as it has been? (laughs) Because it's often referred to as as the slippery slope fallacy. Um, But Uh. people like yourself have been saying that they're not going to stop at cigarettes and booze. And is that just all of this bearing out now? Could Uh. we actually end up with a meat tax? Surely I've won that argument by now. I thought thought that had happened with the sugar tax at the latest. Yeah, obviously the slippery slope is real. It's, It's futile to deny it. The funny thing about the slippery slope, apart from being, as you say, a logical fallacy, which... Yeah, technically it is, even if it happens to be a practical reality, is that you can make these arguments. You know, if you start doing this, you'll be taxing meat before you know it. You'll be taxing soft drinks. And everyone laughs and goes, oh, don't be ridiculous. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, they've been beaten into submission by health groups saying that sugar's you know, addictive and toxic and uh, meat is killing the planet. And they go, oh, yeah, well, fair enough. You, know. you can be proven right about your warnings, but nobody cares by the time you've been proven right. Mm. Dominic, have you got anything you want to come back on? It's quite interesting if you look at another famous syntax, alcohol. Prior to 1913 in the United States, taxes on alcohol were one of the biggest sources of revenue to the United States government, with the exception of tariffs. There was a guy called William Wheeler. He was the biggest force in the prohibition movement. Wayne Wheeler, not William Wheeler. One of the things that he realised, that if he was ever going to get alcohol banned, before he could get it banned was that he needed to find an alternate source of revenue for the government in order to just... Because they were never going to ban it while they had the revenue. And so he became the biggest single campaigner for the adoption of income tax in the USA. And after they adopted income tax in in 1913, um, then the door was open to, to get alcohol banned. And in 1932, they've actually found some... Recently discovered some... Uh, surveys that had been buried in Herbert Hoover's archives in the 1932 election. Hoover was standing on the prohibition ticket. And the, the, the narrative we hear now is that people wanted Roosevelt's deal, they were angry about the Depression. But according to these surveys that have shown, is actually, no, the reason the public voted for Roosevelt was because they wanted to be able to drink again. And But Roosevelt, the prohibition lobby was so strong, and it did this moral thing of smearing anyone who stood against it, that... The reason, the moral reason that Roosevelt used to justify making alcohol legal again was that he was going to tax it. And so this this weird relationship that goes on between taxes and morals and how they use it to justify... So in a way, we want meat to be taxed and then it'd be more difficult for it to be prohibited later on. Maybe that's the key. Possibly. But you see, that didn't work with fixed dog betting terminals because uh, two or three years no, ago, didn't. George Osborne started taxing. 25% he put the tax on fixed dog betting terminals profits. And I thought, well, maybe that will 
stifle this movement. Did that and, and change Philip the odds? Philip, no, it didn't. Fixed odds, you see, they're fixed. Oh, so, so you just taxed them on the the three percent profit. Just taxed them on the profits. Okay. So the government was making a lot of money. It was making four hundred million pounds. It is this year making four hundred million pounds from fixed odds betting terminals. That's why there was so much resistance from Philip Hammond, the only other man in the country apart from me who was opposed <laughs> to, to this change, and for good reason. Yeah, yeah. four hundred million pounds is not chicken feed. And now it looks like he's going to be taxing the online gambling companies um, instead, I'm trying to get the same amount of money back. So just just to close this section, Chris, do you think there is actually any um, reasonable prospect of this meat tax actually coming through? I mean, isn't it just that little bit too ridiculous even for the government to put through? I don't think you can ever say that about anything these days. Um, I, you know, it's not. I, I, the sugar tax and plain packaging for tobacco were both regarded as totally absurd by most people when they were first proposed. And within a couple of years, they were completely orthodox. So, uh, no, I wouldn't expect it to happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but some kind of tax on some form of probably processed meat, you know, anything that's associated with not the upper classes will have a pretty good chance of going through. You're listening to Last Orders, Spike's nanny state podcast. Spike has no paywalls and no subscriptions. It's contributions from readers and listeners like you who keep us fighting for freedom and democracy. If you'd like to support Spiked, go to spiked-online.com and hit the big red donate button in the top right of the homepage. Now, back to the show. So finally, let's talk about vaping. So e-cigarettes, have, we've talked about a fair few times on this podcast, really ought to be the kind of public health busybody's dream come true. They are allowing many people to enjoy nicotine without a lot of the health problems associated with it they seem to have done to smoking rates particularly in the uk what years of you know plain packaging and smoking bans and syntaxes never managed to do in terms of bringing those down and yet it still seems that every week we're reading a new story about a particular government clamping down on the more onerous measures just recently federal regulators in the us launched a crackdown announcing a kind of epidemic of vaping amongst young people which seems to be the new trend and of course it wasn't that long ago that the eu has already made it a criminal offense to buy vape juice in larger quantities than 10 milliliters so it feels like despite the fact again this big boon to public health is constantly being um, trashed chris just to kind of get a sense of where we're at with vaping because it feels like there's just many stories each day about what's going on with it but What's going on with regulation at the moment? Where are getting it right and where are getting it wrong? Well, basically in the UK, we're, we're very lucky. I edit the Nanny State Index, um, which is fairly self-explanatory. Um, a league table of countries according to their paternalistic lifestyle. Who's the worst? Bans. Um, Finland. By is a, it the a worst? A long chalk, yeah, a long chalk. Terrible. A terrible on everything across the board. The UK could probably leapfrog Finland if it put a bit of effort in and was <laughs> and, and was more harsh on vaping. Vaping is the only thing that the UK doesn't have a very high score on. Look around the rest of the world and it's insane what's going on, including America. You know, you know people who think that America is this great liberal free market capitalist democracy, look at what they're doing with vaping. So under Obama, the Food and Drug Administration got authority to regulate tobacco, which is always going to be a bad idea. Um, Their main idea is just taking nearly all the nicotine out of cigarettes. This idea is popped up by some... So what, you're just left with the tar? You're just left, yeah. It's it's basically the exact opposite of e-cigarettes, where they've Mm. got rid of the harmful stuff and kept the stuff that people enjoy. Under the FDA, you, you get rid of the thing that people enjoy and you keep all the harmful stuff that's bad for your lungs. So that's their main brainwave. Their secondary brainwave is to effectively stamp out vaping. It's really a harm maximization uh, policy <laughs> that they're pursuing in the United States at the moment. Um, and they've really gone for it in the last few months because of Juul. And Juul is not available in Britain, or at least it's not available in the American uh, form, thanks to the EU, um, because it's quite high in nicotine. But it's really good. I've tried the American product. It's, it's really is fantastic. Um, and it kind of, it doesn't look stupid. It's not a big, bulky, horrible thing like you know, that I use and most people use is actually relatively sexy. It kind of looks like a USB stick. It's small. It, you know, it's not as cool as a cigarette, but it's not that far off. And as a result of being very good at delivering nicotine and getting people off cigarettes and looking fairly cool, it's had a certain amount of uptake with people who are under the age of 18. And so based on the kind of think of the children, it's a, it's a teenage nicotine epidemic. Uh, the FDA have massively clamped down on e-cigarettes they are banning all flavors apart from what is called tobacco flavor. It doesn't actually taste like tobacco. 
uh, mint and menthol. That's it. That's what they're, they're banning. They're also planning, incidentally, on banning menthol cigarettes for some reason. They, they think that kids like menthol cigarettes. They don't particularly, but there you go. Um, so they're destroying the e-cigarette market in America on the pretext that loads of school kids are secretly using Juul. They raided. They had a dawn raid on <laughs> Juul's office. It took like 10,000 pages of documents. That's it. Like the, they were the, yeah. terrorists or that's something. Like the, that's like the Food Standards Agency or something raiding mm. somebody's office. It's like, how much power Mr. do these Kipling people have in America? So yeah, it's really insane in America. There's so much anti-vaping scaremongering and now really terrible legislation. So, you know, let's be slightly cheerful, I guess, about not having a government how, like that. How bad is it for you? Vaping. Vaping. Well, the, the, the Public Health England, they, they don't think there's any realistic possibility that it could carry more than 5% of the risk of smoking cigarettes. They haven't found any plausible reason to think it's going to harm you beyond raising the heartbeat slightly. I mean, given how much more effective it's been at getting people off smoking than... Um, than, you know, patches and gum and inhalers and all those kind of things, all of which get subsidy via the NHS. They're effectively subsidised. And given that vaping's happened sort of quite organically, I mean, I, I can't think that governments wouldn't be throwing money at it. If, it, if it's getting... I, I, I read some numbers in the UK. It's helped one and a half million UK smokers quit um, cigarettes and another 1.7 million cut down. Given how effective it's been, surely they should be promoting it then i mean what mm. why there must, there must be an argument why they are banning it is there a genuine there health are, argument there are a or? few reasons i think one reason is that big tobacco and big pharma are more powerful in the united states than they are in the eu and britain and big pharma doesn't want it big pharma is totally against it because they're making the patches and the gum and the basically the, for the, which they get subsidy. The, the, the rival the rival products um, big tobacco is kind of split on it. I think some of the tobacco companies in America are still basically anti e-cigarettes. Some, some of them, to be fair, are, are more positive towards it. Um, and then you just have the um, the hardcore Puritans. You know, it was always an interesting thought experiment when I first started writing about tobacco issues and anti-smoking ten years ago. It was an interesting thought experiment to say what would happen if they suddenly found a vaccine for lung cancer. COPD, all the diseases caused by smoking. Or to put it another way, what if they, they invented a genuinely safe cigarette? How many people in the anti-smoking movement would still be against smoking just because they don't like the smell of it, just because they think it's immoral to be kind of hooked on something? And the e-cigarette issues made that question real. And we found our answer, especially in America. Yeah. Loads of people are still against it. You know, it's not about health. It's about some other weird thing about controlling people, mm -hmm. about um, just the morality of you know, senseless. When you're pleasure. smoking, you can't be working. You can only be thinking. <laughs> you can't, can you? All you can be doing is thinking and talking. And in the act of smoking, you are inspiring. You are breathing in. And that's where we get this idea of somebody being inspired, breathing in. When you're smoking, you are inspiring. So for that reason, surely we, if we can find a way of inspiring without <laughs> that's one twentieth as damaging as as uh, normal cigarettes, then surely we should encourage it. But it's almost like coming back a little bit to the gambling. I mean, I'm not even 100% clear how gambling is a public health issue, for instance. It's not. And similarly with smoking and drinking. I mean, for, it wasn't that long ago that public health was about communicable disease. It was about making sure the water supply was clean. It was about doing things like that. I mean, as you say, Chris, it does just feel like what this is getting towards is that at the bed of this is a moralism, yeah. a puritanism, a desire that well, people wouldn't do things that offended their sensibilities. Yeah. And it, in, so are you saying that basically the, the vaping thing is just the ultimate proof of that? It doesn't matter yes, pe that people, it's making people feel better, it's people making people's health in, better. People in public health who used to be in the anti-smoking movement and still are yeah, anti-tobacco, who are now anti-vaping, are moralistic puritans. Simple as that. In the UK, there was a split for a while and and it was very difficult to see which way it was going to go, but there was a lot of people who were kind of thinking, oh, actually, a lot of people have given up smoking about oh, you know, due to this. And others were like, no, this is wrong, this is bad. And then when the tobacco industry got involved, that was even worse. Oh, my God, we, the, the tobacco industry is in favour of it. We have to be against it. So you you got this absolutely moralistic uh, impulse. And in the end, in the UK, the prag pragmatists won. The people who actually deal with smokers and care genuinely about getting people off cigarettes because they really think it's bad for you and don't want kids to start smoking, they were in favour of vaping. They won the day. In America, they haven't won the day. In Australia, they certainly haven't won the day. Loads of places around the world 
um, have a terrible attitude towards vaping. Hong Kong, another great capitalist success story. Just banned them only recently. Singapore too, you know. So yeah, being free market doesn't mean that you're uh, libertarian by by any means in some of these countries. You've been listening to Last Orders. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please do give us a rating and a review and head to spiked-online.com to read Spiked every day of the week. Thanks for listening and see you next time.